just to say that I'm not a diabetologist, I'm a pediatrician. I do a, just one day a week of pediatrics, chill, treating overweight children who are at risk of diabetes. For the rest of the time, I do research. Uh, I do sort of score studies in clinical trials. And mostly, my job is to, uh, to put a dampener on all your hopes that have been raised about the potential of AI, because as an academic, my role is to be negative rather than positive. So I'll try and give you some, some examples if I can. See, I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, what kind of thing people are talking about in the literature in terms of emerging use cases, and then highlight the challenges and opportunities for research, which is what I tend to do mostly. So this is just a figure. It's, it's not made by me. It's from a recent uh, review article in, in Lancet Diabetes and Technology, where they try to map out a whole range of uh, activities that is uh, going on in this space right now. Uh, all the way from the, the entire sort of continuum of care from, from prevention and, and, and risk stratification on to primary and secondary care, as well as early detection of complications. I'll give a few examples where there's most activity amongst these, uh, and then I'll sort of highlight the, the, the challenges of those. So firstly, in terms of the space of detection and prediction, there's been lots of uh, machine learning models built uh, by lots of people over the years. Uh, mostly using electronic health records, trying to predict who might get diabetes. Uh, I think a challenge with some of these models, especially in reference to the Indian context, is that in most places we still don't have enough uh, good quality electronic health records to be building these kind of models and predicting things. There's also lots of work done in being in, in trying to use uh, digital biomarkers, so trying to, you know, you have your uh, finger thing that you can put on a mobile phone, it uses what is called a polypresmography, it looks at the, the fluctuation of the light, as well as people trying to look at the fundoscope to, to predict diabetes. So there's been some work done in those, uh, and some level of uh, accuracy of prediction, but often the challenge tends to be around not enough validation of these models. So they're often models developed in one context, and they're not ready to test in another context. And I'll come to those in a minute. The second space in which there's a lot of activities around self-management, uh, both in terms of behavioral as well as, as, as medication management. People have already spoken about these kind of apps that allow you to look at uh, somebody's food uh, and, and try to uh, predict the amount of calories, as well as use of LLM now in terms of chatbots, which are often, you know, you can tag them to your own guideline and people, it'll work off the same guidelines and help you give the advice to, to, the, to the people. There are often some full-fledged platform now. This is probably the only, I think, the only FDA-approved uh, full-fledged app right now, which has got elements of AI within it. Again, a, a challenge with a lot of these uh, technologies is, is the lack of uh, robust sort of behavior science built into them, as well as la lack of hard outcome data from, from patients. So I'll come to that in a minute. And then briefly, I think you heard about this before, this around uh, trying to help it with uh, insulin dosage and things, and there's uh, applications that allow people to, to titrate their doses as well as some voice-based agent bit like Alexa. You can speak to the agent, it'll help you guide the amount of dose that you must have in your insulin. And similarly, there's decision support tools built for doctors, which might be of uh, interest to, to people here. There's a lot of work going on in terms of, of, of of helping with the dose titration and helping with the, what is called therapeutic inertia, because we know often doctors will not increase their dose in many contexts. I have a PhD student from Thailand who's currently working on this, trying to develop solution on helping doctors to overcome that inertia, which, which often happens. Plus there's these other kind of machine learning algorithms to, to help uh, titrate the, the dose of the insulin that some of you might be familiar with. There's a lot of work going on in, in, in sort of uh, predicting or diagnosing complications. There's a lot of work around uh, using, uh, predicting eye complications and diagnosing them through use of fundoscopy. Uh, there's machine learning systems that are run on existing systems as well as increasingly you can get attachments that you can add on to a mobile phone that you can then use to predict complications. Again, I'll come to, to, to challenges with these in a, in, a, in a minute. They all sound very, it's going to be seductive to look at them, but uh, often they don't perform so well in the real world. Likewise, there's work going on in prediction of, of neuropathy and uh, especially diabetic foot ulcer complications. 
there's work done around trying to, to diagnose and, and manage ulcers uh, using images, so helping you diagnose what kind of, uh, whether it's infected or not, or what kind of uh, outcome measurements you require, as well as trying to predict uh, impending ulcers. So the early stage ulcers are inflamed, so these kind of thermographic cameras, they can detect early changes or heat signals and help you tell the patient that the ulcer is coming so they can offload if they want to at that point. So, coming to my, uh, the topic that's of greater interest to me, which is about uh, challenges to adoption uh, and the difficulties that we face. So, broadly there's kind of four major challenges uh, that we've noticed so far. Uh, there's model performance issues. So, a lot of these studies you'll come across, you'll come across hundreds of papers like this talking about model for this or model for that. Invariably, the model built on a population validated within the same population with very little ma validation in different populations. And we know from these studies, you know, as you know, uh, uh, the context that you might have in India is going to be very different from a context in UK or US. And trying to take a model from there and get it to work here, you can be sure that the model perform performance is to the point that it's not really usable. So these models are practically useless uh, when you adopt them from, from elsewhere. And I'll give you some concrete examples, but, but they're, they're pretty useless. Uh, the other one is about acceptability. So again, uh, people build these models, publish lots of papers. When you actually give it to, uh, I mean, you all know your practices that you got practice, you got a queue of patient waiting outside. Uh, you don't have the time to actually stop your consultation with the patient, fire up a, a new app for one particular thing and, and use it. And so a lot of these, uh, and likewise, you know, if you were look, looking up an app, the patient won't have much trust in what you're trying to do as well. So a lot of these solutions often fail because the acceptability, both from the physician using it as well as other stakeholders tends to be uh, quite low. As somebody mentioned earlier, there's safety issues, trust, accountability, responsibility. So you have an app, something goes wrong, who's responsible? Uh, will you be held accountable or will your app be or will the app maker or the model maker be held accountable? So these are kind of questions that people are just so it's coming over right now. Somebody earlier mentioned about the paper they've published uh, using chat GPT and did the analysis with the help of chat GPT. I'm not really sure who will be held liable if there's a retraction tomorrow. Uh, that, is, that is said by the International uh, Journal of Medical Ethics. That's reassuring to know, but uh, as I'm sure you'll appreciate, uh, these kind of LLM models are, are probability models. Uh, they have a tendency to hallucinate. And, and we don't really know what they've done. So trying to take responsibility, I'll be slightly more concerned about taking responsibility for an LLM. Uh, I'm happy to use it for just looking up something online, but trying to be responsible for an LLM, I don't think most of the LLM makers will, will feel that comfortable yet, but uh, there you go. And then of course, infrastructure issues. So a lot of these uh, things fail in, in the community today because you know, as you know, internet is not very fast. You're in the middle of doing something and internet is a bit down, what happens then? So a lot of these big models also need uh, infrastructure to run. So if you're in a slightly remote area, uh, there's a struggle to use it on an older phone or an older device. So going to opportunities for research, which I hope that might be of interest to some of the, the audience here, because most of you are clinicians here, so you have access to patients and, and, and interest in the problem. So I think, uh, I've got these four things that I wanted to highlight uh, and maybe hope for you to go and sort of reflect on this. The first one is finding real world use cases. To me, this is the biggest barrier today. Nearly almost all of these apps by default are made by IIT graduates uh, who are average age of 25, who've never seen a real world patient or had a real world health problem themselves to actually appreciate what challenges people face or the doctors face. And this is why I think a lot of the time a uh, problem happens. So they will design things of minute by minute glucose monitoring without realizing that most doctors in the real hard end of practice of, of a queue of patients waiting in a government hospitals don't have the luxury to do minute by minute monitoring in the spare time of the, of the patient's glucose. So I think what, what a lot of these people need is collaboration with clinicians such as yourselves who have real world problems that you are facing in your practice and then trying to collaborate with a technician to say, okay, this is a problem. Can you find a solution rather than letting the te te technicians uh, trying to find problems to solve or, or, or as technology with a problem to, to work on? 
next one is about understanding implementation barriers. Again, there's very little understanding in this world of, uh, of tech startups about what are the barriers to implementing these solutions in the, in the real world workflows of the physicians, other nurses, uh, community health workers. And a good understanding is really paramount because any solution really has to integrate in the workflow of the doctor or whoever is using that instrument. The moment there's a break and it takes a second more, it's gone. The doctor will not use it again. So you have to, I'm sure you'll appreciate that more than this. Then, of course, we talked about models. So these models only work as good as the local data is. Most of them fail to, to generalize. So there's a need to, to generate your own data, uh, if you can, in terms of working within health system or context. And, and that will allow more usable models to be built uh, that will perform relatively well within your own population and have some, some value. And then finally, generating evidence on the real world impact. So this is where, you know, evidence on where something is feasible or acceptable to the people who are using it. Then safe, uh, effectiveness, uh, safety, cost equity. So a lot of these things, there's a lot of assumptions out there that doctors, is, we don't have a doctor somewhere or we don't have the money to the paid doctor, so we'll give an app or a technology and it'll do everything. And so the money will be saved or the time will be saved. I'll give some examples So when people have done studies, they have actually found that it doesn't really do any of those. So it doesn't really save any time or money in the end when you've actually implemented some of these solutions because there's a cost to these solutions. With, with even the chat GPT that, that you check every minute, there's a huge amount of cost at the back end that the, the startup is bearing for now. But the moment they re release the real cost on you, you'll find that it's actually not so, so cheap eventually as well as scalability, what we discussed about uh, trust in technical infrastructure. So just to give you a few examples, so this is just a, a, a sort of PubMed hits of, of, of studies involving diabetes and AI. And, and the, the yellow bar is just studies mentioning diabetes and AI, and the, the green bar is, is the implementation study where they're actually looking at, at the real world impact or real, real world study done with patients. And that's where the bar is really low. You can see only 200 studies. I had another slide where then you narrow it down to studies done in, in low and middle income countries like India and all, and the, the bar is not, you can't really see it, so I took it out. So you can imagine there's probably hardly any study done uh, in, in a context such as India, I mean, uh, that, that you can sort of count on. This is a slide of, of, of FDA approved software devices that use AI uh, in healthcare. So far, I think there's about eight or 900 uh, as of now, of which uh, these are the specialities. I think the key things to note is, unfortunately, there isn't a, a bar for diabetes, probably buried somewhere within others. Uh, but the key point to note is that only, uh, this is a study done from about a, a year or two back, when there are about 500 uh, or so devices that have been uh, validated, software devices, by the way, not I mean, you heard about the hardware one, CGM is all, they're not counted because these are hardware devices. These are only software as a device. And of those 500, only half had been clinically validated, i.e. there was a human being involved. Rest is all using synthetic data, using in-lab things, other things. So people forget that FDA mark doesn't mean too much. It, it doesn't require a human study to be done, unlike a drug trial. So for some of these things, you can run synthetic thing, you can come up with a software to improve x-ray reading and that will all count for FDA approval. So hardly any and then only a quarter of those have been prospectively validated in a, in a proper kind of a study of any nature and, and a randomized clinical trial only 4% of the 500 or so. We're talking about 20, 30 studies to, to date uh, of real human beings in clinical trials. So real world utility, again, you know, when we look at some of these uh, papers, we often forget uh, the point. So I looked at this uh, more recent uh, paper uh, which I uh, showed earlier about trying to predict diabetes. And uh, my obvious interest was, so I, I tried to look in the paper and uh, figure out what was the prediction. So this is the one with the plethysmograph, you know, using that uh, phone-based polyphysismo thing, you know, what uh, you put your finger on a mobile phone and it gives you a heart rate and things, or some similar kind of things being used to predict diabetes. And it looks very interesting, oh, you read a newspaper article, AI can diagnose diabetes without a blood test. And then you try and see, uh, then the obvious question I ask is, I've got a patient in front of me, I know their height and weight, or even if I don't know it, I can just see whether they're overweight or not. What's the extra benefit 
of any of this AI technology over and above what we is very easily accessible like height and weight. Unfortunately, as is often the case, there wasn't actually a, a prediction score given, even though they had the BMI data, they don't provide the independent prediction of BMI so I can compare it to the polypithismograph. And the incremental benefit, as you can see above the BMI and age, gender and race is only from 0.8, it's almost more or less the same. So then you have to think, what is the added benefit? So this is where I think the challenge is uh, people not thinking very hard about uh, meaningful use cases. So if you have a patient, what is exactly of value as opposed to just trying to build a model for, for the sake of, of predicting something? Similarly, uh, in terms of, uh, there's a lot of these fundoscopies we looked at trying to predict uh, diabetic retinopathy. There's lots of these models. There's a very famous Google model which was developed years back, including data from India in, in multiple sites. Uh, this is actually the actual model using uh, desperate, but this is not using any of those, you know, those contraptions used on mobile phones. This is a proper uh, hardware-based solution. And when they tried to look at the performance of Google's model, it didn't do too well in Thailand where they ran a very big study, which is why Google lost uh, interest uh, pretty soon afterwards. And the challenge they found was that the quality of the fundus images that they had in their Stanford lab was not the same quality, even from a proper desk-based device within a clinic in Thailand, which has got fairly good systems. But still, there's lots of challenges in, in getting good quality data to come out. Finishing, yeah, I'll just finish in one second. Uh, similarly, other studies, we've done our own, we've done similar kind of studies in, in our, I run a cohort study in Telangana. We've tried to look at fundoscopy and thermography for foot care. Uh, for fundoscopy, using the, a cheaper device, half the images are not even really readable uh, very well. So again, it doesn't work so well. And for thermography too, we find with the Indian feet, uh, with the walking barefoot kind of thing, it's very hard to, to look at this. Studies on economic evaluation, again, are, are quite challenging. This is a study done in multiple countries where they found that this prediction was cost effective in USA and Singapore, but not so much in Thailand and Brazil. Can anybody guess why? No, it's just that uh, in USA and Singapore, the doctors are very expensive, so the technology works out cheaper, but in countries where actually the, the cost of doctor consultation is not so much like in Thailand and Brazil, actually the cost of technology was greater of implementing the technology than just going to a doctor to, to finish it. And this is just the last slide, just in terms of, of trust in technology. So uh, this is a very large global study that's done every year, trying to understand the interest of uh, faith people have in technology. And as you can see, uh, patients have some interest in medical diagnosis, but even though we might think chatbots are a good thing, somehow patients don't seem to, to think so much. So that's just something to, to bear in mind. And I'm going to thank